Good evening. Uh, I'd like to call the order of the meeting, the special meeting of the Hickory City Council. And I'll turn it over to our city manager, Mr. Warren. Mayor really. Guests and members of council, Mr. Crone. Um, over the years, you know, we have worked to improve our land development code and have really simplified the land development code. And this is the next round of text amendments related to that. So we felt like it was worthy of a special uh, presentation and, and workshop and discussion to really understand what's, uh, fully understand what's in this, um, um, this round of uh, amendments. So with that, uh, I'll ask Brian Frazier, City's Planning Director, to come to the podium and present those changes. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Mr. Mayor, Members of Council, Mr. Wood, Mr. Crone. Um, good afternoon. Um, as Mr. Wood said, I mean, we, we take a look at our, our text amendments that come up in the Land Development Code, which again is the law. Uh, it includes our anything from uh, subdivision, lighting, landscaping, um, stormwater, zoning, subdivision, the whole nine yards is included in our land development code, which most counties call UDOs, Unified Development Ordinances. But our LDC, uh, we try to update this tweak, if you will, annually. And um, you uh, recently, last August, um, reapproved re-accepted uh, the um, adopted the Hickory by Choice 2030 plan. It was a major five-year revision. So the land development code was soon to follow and these are the text amendments that we'll present tonight. We wanted to see how much was needed and upon such review our staff identified a number of recommend recommended amendments but we have not identified anything really large scale to be amended or reviewed at this time unless you tell me otherwise tonight. So some of the highlights, uh, anything from correction of typos, basically administrative actions within the code, uh, revisions necessary to comply with recent revisions to either North Carolina general statutes, in this case, in some case subdivisions, or to federal law, in this case the U.S. Supreme Court's uh, ruling versus, it was Reed versus the town of Gilbert over a church sign uh, regarding content neutrality that we cannot uh, review the message of the sign, only its height and, and size limits, not what the sign says under the First Amendment of the Constitution. And then we identified the BOA, the Board of Adjustment, and not the Planning Commission as the correct jurisdictional body to hear appeals to administrative decisions regarding property subdivisions. So that, even though it's it doesn't seem like a big deal, it is under general statute, and that was something we needed to revise. And the Planning Commission is the Board of Adjustment. Yes. Well, you're fast with that question. Mm -hmm. I was just getting ready to ask. It is. They just wear that, figu that, that figurative uh, different so hat. So for the, for the new board, would you explain how, why that transition took place, or that the, the combination of Board of Adjustment and the Planning Commission? Well, years before I got here, there was a, a separate Planning Commission. Um, there was a Subdivision Review Board. There was a Board of Adjustment. And a lot of communities do it different ways. It just made a lot of sense to combine the two boards for their, their expert opinions and getting just a, a concise ruling. Even though we regularly have regularly scheduled planning commission meetings, the Board of Adjustment doesn't meet on a regular basis. It just um, it meets at a time when there is um, a variance, an area variance, a dimensional type variance has happened maybe two or three times since Mr. Overby and I've been here and maybe half a dozen to a dozen times when someone didn't like the planning director's interpretation, um, the Board of Adjustment would meet to hear the citizen's concern versus the city's interpretation. Does that satisfy the question for everyone? Okay. Um, one thing we did to increase neighborhood protection um, is within the IND Industrial Zoning District we are now requiring screening of rooftop RTUs under the uh, HVAC equipment that's adjacent to res residentially zoned properties. So before those units only had to be screened from a, a major thoroughfare and now we're just trying to add some neighborhood protection because there, in the Hickory there's not a lot of well-developed transitional zones. We've tried to um, 
permit them, allow them, increase the number of them, but we have a lot of districts where residential subdivisions, especially in our older neighborhoods, are directly contiguous abutting to our industrial areas. So we're doing this for the, the neighborhood protection. Also, the high-rise sign overlay district, we revised that to increase the allowable sign area from 150 to 200 square feet. That's just something that's being done um, across the state and across the country, so it still isn't looking like a postage stamp when you're driving 80 miles an hour on I-40, but it's not gonna look huge or oversized either. Um, Article 6, this is an interesting one. It's ongoing, um, both locally and in the state of North Carolina General Assembly, electronic gaming operations. We removed that from the use table in order to comply with state law. Uh, the state took away the um, internet gaming, um, the electronic gaming, the sweepstakes, and the bingo. Now they do allow games of skill. <laughs> that's tough to that's tough to regulate that's maybe more of a police operation than it is a zoning enforcement operation uh, but I've talked to um, our local elected leaders there was a bill in the state Senate that made it through the Senate but didn't make it through the house about a year or so ago there's been several cases the uh, the lawyers are many and the lobbyists are many for the gaming industry and so right now we Basically, by law, if they meet our criteria, they have, we have to allow skilled-based games. But a lot of those end, that, uh, end up changing or transitioning illegally to games of chance. <coughs> and some people have put those machines in gas stations, convenience stores that never got an approval from us. So a lot of this is really riding on what the General Assembly does and what law enforcement deems to be um, legal or illegal under the state under the state statute was there a question? Um, a question yes ma'am so there are two i'm aware of that just popped up that are exclusively you know irish arcade or fishing something mm -hmm. okay. well actually three that i've seen and people have asked they said are those legal mm. depending on what games are inside of them yes if they're a skilled based game most of the people but do we monitor or has anybody gone in to check we or? we monitor them during their um, preliminary and final inspections and once they're open um, law enforcement usually goes in either with um, a uniformed officer or a plainclothes officer to make sure that the games are legal the games are supposed to be re regulated by the industry if you will and there's supposed to be a sticker on them that says they've been regulated by the industry most of the gables that, that most of the games we see here are fish tables they're flat tables uh, you can sit about the size of a pool table you can sit eight or ten people around them feed them quarters tokens credit card what have you it's a 3d display it looks like you're looking into an ocean and you're figuratively shooting stabbing nuking fish in a barrel and they have the same game at hickory dickory dock and chuck e cheese so they've turned what was a kids game into a gambling venture and some of these seem to work fine um you know i've been in a few and at 56 i'm the youngest person there um i don't have an oxygen tank but there's a lot of other ones that uh <laughs> that have undesirable elements have moved in where there's been um illegal drugs illegal betting um, some of these operations have been closed down voluntarily some have been closed down by hickory law enforcement or the county sheriff's office we had one legitimate gaming operation up near that strip mall up near um, mdi on 120 on 321 north excuse me and caldwell county came in and told the people you're shut down as of now and they, you know, they left the they left the property, and they were looking for another site. Um, so the interpretation around the state with law enforcement isn't consistent, nor is it with zoning. I mean, there's been other cities, other municipalities in the state that have saying we're banning these and have gotten sued. So right now we're allowing them. Um, they seem to have hit somewhat of a peak. At one time they were at 13, they were close up to 20, now they're back down to about a dozen again. It seems to depend a lot on the location of them as to what folks frequent them. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Now, what, uh, what effect will the Supreme Court decision have on gaming. some gaming areas now that they, they just passed a, the Supreme Court just 
said that you can have uh, betting on uh, basketball, football, professional, and college is going to be legal. So regulated by the states. But yeah, yeah right. Yeah. So we don't have it in North Carolina. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's yeah. something yeah. where yeah. The yeah. labor North Carolina yeah. is a prime one to get it. Uh, As Councilman Lyle well says, we're waiting to see what impact, if any, there will be on local municipalities. Well, discrimination so. issue. I think Nevada was allowed, but no other state was. No, Mississippi had it. Mississippi and mm -hmm. okay. Okay. anyway. Or another head. Probably going to make legalized gambling. Maybe the, the water is more. It's going to clear them. But I think that, you know, I'm assuming nothing is going to happen until after the November election, so maybe after January we'll, we'll see something come about because there's a lot of people that are adamantly opposed to this and, you know, I understand the reasons, the reasons why, so we're just closely monitoring um, our local chapter of the American Planning Association and the and legislative Do sites they, on the web. Are, is, are alcoholic beverages allowed in no. any of those things? That's and no one has no one has ever applied for them. Although I've heard that there have been people bringing you know bringing in your own beer and have been asked to leave. But some of these, some people basically they have bouncers, armed guards, at the site because they're expecting trouble. It depends on where they are and it depends on who manages them. Right. I mean it's. I can't even say that it's all the same in northeast or southwest or. It all depends on the business. I've had discussions with municipal lawyers before, during, and after the Supreme Court opinion. And I, the North Carolina lawyers that I've talked to, we don't feel like it's going to affect North Carolina. I don't think our legislature is going to, based on prior uh, decisions they've made, are going to go out on that limb. Okay. Um, we're also. We're, going to re we're recommending requiring additional screening um, with open storage visible from private and public streets. The uh, should be chain link fencing, I'm sorry for the typo, um, with the slatting would no longer be considered to be acceptable. Um, basically, we used to allow, we used to have it had to be 90% opaque. That's tough to enforce, what's 90%? And a lot of it over time will get damaged faded with the sun and it gets brittle. I mean, either the vinyl or the plastic will eventually crack and shatter and any the business owners paying for it twice. So we're pushing, we're pushing now more with natural screening with walls or with vegetation. So can, let Push me it. ask on that one, because I've been around, I was, and I, I guess you, were you here when we went to the screening? Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, right. Sir. right. I, I can't oh, yeah. remember what time. Were you here too? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and we had, you know, we actually had to extend the time frames, and that was one of the things we said, well, you know, we sort of added in as a compromise. Mm -hmm. um, so the folks that did that and have the slats, Will they now be in violation no. of the code? They would no. be grandfathered. It would be considered grandfathered, and it would be new businesses from here on out. From here okay. on out. And a lot of them didn't even want to use the slatting. They were basically using heavy-duty landscape fabric, if you right, will. Right. Yeah, and the, yeah. the twist ties break, and they blow in the wind, and it, it just really looks unsightly. So we're trying to beef that up a little bit, mostly again to protect. Um, the residential neighborhoods. Yeah. But once someone's fencing becomes, or barrier becomes to a certain uh, downgraded and diminished, if they did anything new, they would have to. We, we notify them and let them know they have to fix it. It's happened with some of our uh, established junkyards, mm -hmm. and we've asked them to fix it. I mean, just as the same, I got a call this afternoon, a neighbor was complaining that some of the trees up at Publix in the parking lot had died, and he wanted to know. What, would, what we would do about it. And I said, we'll give them a letter and they have 30 days to replace it. I mean, that's part of the, the code. So it's it's similar in nature. Are okay. there any other questions about but, this? But slide? if the slatting deteriorates, will they be required to meet the new standard? Yes. Okay. To, to what degree? Because there's... They'll have to comply with the new code if it deteriorates to a point where, I mean, if it's a certain section of it, we'll probably have them replace it. It'll be I, pretty much my uh, determination. Okay. And then they can challenge that with the Board of Adjustment. <laughs> I really don't want to read it. <laughs> so we don't write the planning decision. You go back to the planning commission and they change their hat for an adjustment. Okay. But no, we went we went through that and 
I mean, we had over 80 that were out of compliance that we were able to bring back in within less than a year. Well, that's good. Then we had worked with the Chamber of Commerce and ended up getting their full cooperation as well. I've heard some concerns lately from uh, McDonald Parkway. I think the DOT puts that on the fencing there that it's deteriorating. Oh, regarding the quarry? Yes. Does the same rules apply to that, or is that a different scenario? Well, we, we can put it in the code, but whether the state would uh, comply is, is highly doubtful. Okay. So I think we need an overlook there. <laughs> <laughs> so in, that, in that case, all we can do is ask them. We would, we would ask them. I think they originally were talking about putting in a much stronger type fence, you know, in terms of visibility that you wouldn't be able to see through it. Because folks thought, you know, looking at the quarry, driving at what used to be 45 miles an hour would be a distraction. Well, it's deteriorated. It, it's deteriorated, it. yes, definitely so. Um, Multi-family residential development containing more than 150 units would be required to provide at least two vehicular access points. That's chiefly for public safety for emergency vehicles. Um, that's been an issue in the past. Most, not all, but most developers would want that just for the saleability and the safety concerns for their residents, but we don't have anything at the time requiring that. So this would uh, require that if the council uh, does adopt this. Um, we've asked Duke Energy to review our revised landscaping standards to make sure they're in compliance with, uh, they have arborists and horticulturists, a number of them, and the expertise that, that we just don't have. And what's happened over the years until we modified the land development code a few years back with our landscaping section is that folks under the city's our direction, if you will, would plant certain species of trees under high overhead power lines. And eventually those trees would grow to the point that Duke would hire a company to come in and give them a haircut. Well, sometimes when those trees were getting a haircut, not only did it look unsightly, but sometimes the property owners would say, it looks so bad, I'm just gonna cut down the tree. Then they were in violation of our code. So they were in that catch 22. So we've adjusted over the years our manual of practice in the land development code um, that we use the same type of trees where they only grow to a certain point. Um, that, that Duke Energy has uh, has allowed under under their code, and it's worked out rather well. And we have really good communication between us and Duke Energy um, in that in that regard, and it would save the business owner a lot of money in the long term. Also residential, because that's in my neighborhood. I've just noticed the last six weeks, Duke, or a subsidiary of Duke, has come through and cut the trees back around the wire so bad they might as well cut the trees down. Please. Exactly, and that usually yeah. falls to the residential property owner. I mean, that's happened to friends of mine where they took a Bradford pear and they, they cut it in half, and those are dangerous to begin with. It just creates a sale effect. Um, we also asked a couple of local sign companies to review the revised sign standards to make sure that maybe it wasn't too stringent and if they got on the phone and yelled, this is the best thing ever, then I know we, I had made a mistake. So we didn't get that. We said it's, it's not too stringent and you know, we're okay with it. What about changing this or that? And I said no, but they were, they were satisfied. Well, so, some examples of some changes that were made to the sign standards. Um, basically, well, beyond the, um, the changes to the highway district, over the years and, and now, some of the signs were allowing a greater square footage or the number of signs particularly affecting some of those properties like on the strip malls on 70 that are far off the road so they're not necessarily looking like postage stamps. I mean, does it really make a difference if we allow two signs versus three as long as what the square footage allotments are? So that's pretty much what we're looking. Was there any other specifics I missed? Sure. I have, I have a few too that I've noticed sure. that I wanted to ask about. Sure. Um, and the, uh, well, yeah, actually, I, I think I, I wanted to get clarification on the say. Sure, I'm just going that. to that section. We, uh, we have a section in there that exempts certain signs from our regulations. And we took out a whole bunch of stuff that, would, that were exempted um, that had to do, like, for example, flags uh, of a 
civic organization or something like that might be exempted. Um, but the reason I think under, underlying that was because we can't regulate content-based um, signs. But if we're exempting it from the ordinance, are we not then implying that it is subject to the ordinance? You want to answer that one? I think I know what, he, what he's saying. Do you, do you understand the question I'm asking? <clears throat> what section was that specifically in? Is that in uh, 1. 5 page 209? Um, yeah, probably. <clears throat> two what something. are some of the ex uh, examples of exemptions? Um, official flies, insignia of corporate, professional, fraternal, civic, religious, or educational organizations. I think we're limiting the official flag to... Uh, one flag per lot, no more than five by eight feet. I'm reading the section that says signs exempt from regulation. So you took out, the Lenore Ryan University would not be able to fly its Lenore Ryan flag. Or at least under our current code, we it's an exempted sign. Mm -hmm. By taking it out of the exemptions, does it now become your regulated sign? Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, my answer to that would be no. That is not that was not the intent. And, and then of course, yeah, there is something that talks about actual height of the flagpoles and stuff like that. And then so. we took out the section regarding um, political signs, partially because of the Supreme Court decision and partially because of state statute from a few years back that basically allowed political signs to be within the right of way as long as they weren't within three feet of pavement or over 843 square inches. And we, we took we, that section out because basically the state overrode our local ordinance regarding sign regulation for political signs. Right, but now did, do we not have the authority to regulate when they can come up and when they can come down? Yeah. It's basically regulated by the state of North Carolina. So Some we, of those complied with some of those mirrored ours and some of them did not. So you have previously it was 60 days before an election and then they need to come down after the election. Within 10 days. It's very reasonable. Mm -hmm. Now that's out. No, no, that's the state, that's state the state, state that yeah. is the same. Okay, okay. But it's 10 days after the election and the time frame now is b before the date that kicks it off the trigger is the preliminary voting date. That's okay. been something that we've talked to attorneys about in NCAPA, School of Government, and that's fairly clear. Okay. So maybe Hank, maybe the mayor was right yeah. back in the day. Yeah. But that's the opinion of the attorneys now at the School of Government, where they can put the signs up um, 30 days before the um, before the first day of early voting. But they've got to take them down 10 days after. So far, most of the former candidates have, have complied. But then they've got to redo it again when the general election comes up. Mm -hmm. They can't just leave them from the primary, from the end of the primary. No, they cannot. A couple campaigns thought they could until I chatted with them. <laughs> so there's no there, there there would be no reason back to the back to the exemptions if the Illinois University is flying a flag um, CBCC we're not going to start regulating. we're not considering those signs yeah, not yeah, a flag right. no. okay well, gotcha well, while we're on flags and I forget what they're called the skinny the skinny little flags that they fly now there's a name for them the they call them pennant or more commonly feather flags. feather flags they they were in our ordinance it was a matter of interpretation the council several years ago said they didn't want them and we've told folks that but now we're you know codifying it that they are not allowed for whatever reason you know the council back then did not like them and we've had a lot of comments from the general public not liking the pennant or the feather flags where I think part of it in all honesty was the sign companies too because they weren't really selling them and you could get them from uh, Amazon or eBay or what have you and um, it was something that council had mentioned to us several years ago that they didn't want to see and that it was supposed to be put in the ordinance and, I think I forgot to take it, to put it in the ordinance that it would be uh, banned. So, so just for clarification, are you allowed to have any of those or is there a restriction on those? You're not allowed to have any of those. Okay. Um, on signs still, um, another one that, I mean, I, and I thought this one was consequential. Um, 
I mean, but maybe there's something behind it, and I'm misreading. But it's under um, mounting wall signs. Um, oh gosh, in your pa on the pa it'd be page two eleven. Yes, sir. You eliminated the requirement that wall signs be mounted parallel to the building facade, mm -hmm. which to me reads that now you can mount them perpendicular to the building facade. We allowed that before um, only in the C1 district. Now, we're not talking about a 150 square foot sign, but am I reading that wrong? Section 10.5, signs in commercial, office, and institutional, and industrial districts. Well, I like that 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 signs be mounted parallel to the business, to the building facade. Mm -hmm. I don't want to see signs out perpendicular. Okay. Because that's been allowed before in the C1 district, but it's not a huge sign. It would just be one advertising their business. So when you're walking down Union Square, you can see for the next block of which individual business would be there. It, okay. And so now we've allowed it in certain circumstances and other places that have done a mixed use type of development such as like holler mill. Are you looking at 10.5 B? 10.5 B, yeah. <coughs> Building facade. I, like I said, I, 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 I may be, uh, no, no, you're fine. I, I need clarification, you know, maybe that I just need clarification. My vision is that you're driving down Springs Road or 127 and you know, you've got CVS, you know, with a sign sticking out like that right and you're seeing that all the way down i think it would have to, yeah i see what you're saying i mean maybe we can re-clarify um i mean that's what the purpose of the workshop because for. There, there's existing language in there that allows that in c1 in c1 so, but we're right. talking signs about as big right. as a bread right. box because that's, structurally you wouldn't be able to do it right that right yeah but the way i read it like i said i might be reading it wrong okay it's talking about all districts you're eliminating that requirement that they be mounted parallel okay yeah i see yeah. what you're saying Okay. Okay. We'll address that. All right. That was purposeful. That was purposeful. Yeah. Yeah. So the, we're talking about signs that are perpendicular. Yes. Okay. That 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 to me, is, you know, I, I'd see that as consequential and policy level type stuff, not update. Because I think we were looking for in those multi use type districts, such as the beyond the CBD, the Central Business District, because. Um, I know Holler Mill has asked for it. I'm not sure if Moretz asked for it or not. But in mixed use with that type of walkability, to us it just made sense. You know, it was an interpretation that was mine. And we just were looking at codify codifying it within the land development code. Do we, I mean, are we, is it going to have unintended consequences in other areas of the city? It's, it's possible. Yeah. I mean, we have a height requirement that it can't be, it has to have a clearance of eight feet. You know, we have that now, so nobody's bumping their head into it when they're going by. But I guess if somebody wanted to put a ginormous sign in, you know, they'd have to prove it structurally that it could work. But yeah, yeah, sure. sure. Council, well, if you look right before that, mm -hmm. the section that you're referring to is um, three, which was deleted and shown in red. Right. If you look right above that, the projection of the sign can only be 24. Okay, so, so so that would mean that if you were going to mount it, you'd have to mount letters that said CVS. Yes. <laughs> like that, here, here, 24 inches wide. Here, here's, a, here's a prime example, though. Yeah. Catawba Valley Boulevard. Yeah. Between where, which used to be Sunrise Appliance, uh -huh. and that's Blossom Gas. Yeah. Sign. That is what this is intended to accomplish. Okay, I don't do, even, do you, do you, I, Are you familiar I, I, with that? Well, sign? yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm working out there, but I can't remember the sign. But basically, what you're looking at is on the front facade of that wall, which faces Catawba Valley Boulevard, you have a sign that's basically okay, it's it's horizontal hard. to the building. It's, yeah, yeah, it's, but it projects, and it, it projects, projects 24 inches out, and it basically says Blossman on one Blossom. side. Blossman okay. gas going vertically right. on both sides of the sign is what it says. So, okay. So, it's restricted in that, you, you know, we're not, building, we're, we're not building big signs. Out. No, you're not having like a, yeah. a cantilever. Yeah, gotcha. 24 inches, right? Is, That's what it's is, is the extent it can go up. But it can go up. Thank you, Sir? But it can go up. That makes sense. Yeah. So, they, so, he's asking a question on how far up out versus uh, the signs cannot project above the roof line of the building. Mr. Oh, Carroll. okay. That solves that problem. Yes, sir. And it has to be eight feet 
Yeah, you have ah. to have the eight foot clearance. If, it's, clearance if, it, if there's a sidewalk and pedestrian area under it, right. if there's not a pedestrian area under it, say if they're going to put it over, say, say you have a building facade and you have your front, your entrance, yeah. you have a landscaped area, you want to mount the sign 24 inches perpendicular on this particular wall, you wouldn't have the eight foot because you wouldn't have anyone going under it. I guess. So, so you would, so right. that would only come into effect if you had sidewalk, pedestrian, right. or, or something to that nature there. But if it's a three story building, you could you go up three stories. Sure, yeah. 24 and, inches and, out. And, and, and some of that instances you have here in downtown Hickory, some right. of the signs where you have on your upper stories that have businesses on Well, in fact, I think we did that at the Art Center. Uh, we had some signs that went up like two stories sure. mm -hmm. high. As, as, as long as that were, magic, as long as <coughs> they're projecting out 25 <coughs> inches, I think, 24. Yeah, as long as that magic number isn't, threshold isn't reached for area. I got yeah. you. Right, yeah. okay. So, so, so what was the, mo the motivation behind that? To offer better flexibility. A lot of, uh, think about it this way, everyone. Uh, a lot of our zoning districts, we require very minimal setbacks from the road. So theoretically, if someone wanted to come in and build a building that's, say, 10 foot from the road, for, for example, they could do that. By doing that, what they actually do in that instance is they restrict themselves greatly in terms of what they could do for a free sign. For signage, yeah. What, but what this does is it gives them the opportunity to have some of that visibility if you're traveling this way and your building is this way, to actually know that that business is there. Before you get right up on it and you're like this and, and you see a a, a parallel mounted sign. That is part of the idea that goes along with this. Because if our, by our plan as well as by a lot of our codes, what we're promoting is a lot of compact development in around a lot of our major intersections, if you will. And if, if we accomplish that through getting, through building and pushed to the street, narrowed in terms of side setbacks, you're not going to have a lot of freestanding signs because there's not going to be any area. It's just not going to work because if you have a sidewalk and you have right of way, driveways, it's not there. What this does is it offers a bit of additional flexibility in terms of how to get some advertising space out there without being obtrusive and having something very just gaudy, to be honest with you. And that's what we were trying to accomplish, is, is, is in all honesty. We don't allow any LED signs. Uh, now. Actually, we do. We do. We do. The city's never prohibited them whatsoever. Oh, okay. Um, uh, like and that's something that we put into the code a few years ago that, that we had talked about the council had had allowed. I mean, the only thing that we do is basically we regulate the height, we regulate the uh, square footage, um, and we regulate per DOT statute that they can't move, flash, blink, or scroll, and that the message can change only every eight seconds. Okay. We, we do not regulate lumens or the wattage or, or the brightness. Can, can, can we? We could. Um, I know the city of Asheville does it, and I've talked to other planners about it, and I've talked to, um, I've researched it through APA, I've talked to the sign companies. <coughs> we can tell a company you can only have X number of lumens on your sign because they're looking at a certain number of lumens during the day and a certain amount at night, increasing brightness, which makes sense, or decreasing it at night. The problem is, is enforcement. We don't enforce the code at night. We don't enforce it on the weekends. And what are we enforcing during the day? None of my planners, nor am I, trained to regulate and know how to regulate lumens. And what most, what's happened even with a larger city to our west, Asheville, is that they regulated the lumens and the sign company said, okay, this is how we've installed it. And as soon as they get their approval, Joe or Jane Citizen calls the sign company, comes back and says, how do I make, mess with this thing to turn the brightness up again? So I guess for now that will just depend on the, the, on the property owners of the strip mall or it be at their district. Well, it depends. I mean, we, you can't interfere with the traveling public where it's such a distraction. I mean, the one out on 70 years ago before it was replaced, 70 Southeast near Wendy's, that one was made by a foreign company that was really an inferior quality. And there was times where I would drive by it at night that that thing was literally strobing. I mean, it would talk about a distraction. I think Lamar Advertising or another regional firm bought it. They took all that out, they put in something that was much more advanced 
that wasn't ca causing that kind of distraction while you're driving or brightness. Some of the signs that we see, you can, I mean, I can tell it, if they're manufactured here in the States or if they're manufactured overseas with inferior quality. It's hard to regulate taste. As I tell my staff, if we did, I wouldn't be here. But, um, so take your shots. But we recently had a couple of these signs placed, and some of them are more expensive than other ones. And a couple times we've actually told the applicant, is there any way you can turn this down or change the background color from maybe neon blue or green to a black where it's not as obtrusive? I mean, driving up and down 127, a, a big thing now is a lot of the churches want them because they can change their worship times or if they're having a chicken supper or some kind of function. Um, they are super expensive. It's been cost prohibitive in the past, but as technology changes, just like with our TVs and cell phones, the cost comes down. So we're seeing more and more people having these signs. It depends on if, how much they want to pay and if they're going to get something that um, is aesthetically pleasing or something that's going to need some work. So we're, we can limit the size. All In all sign districts, we have limitations on height so and size. Still have a billboard, it's LED. Well, billboards, no. Billboards, that, that changed in our land development code okay, several years ago. We're just talking about a regular, a regular sign. We used to have it where we would allow billboards, which we no longer do, and the signs could be LED if it was only um, advertising basically the time and temperature like a lot of the banks did back in the 70s and 80s. We've changed that because a lot of people now want that more modern look of, of the LED because a lot of the old panels will fade and crack and, and break over time. Just some are the technology is much better than others. But could we regulate it? Yes. Would it be difficult to set up an ordinance or something in the land development code? No, but enforcing it would be next to impossible. Any other questions regarding? Well, it, I got a lot of complaints about the one on 127. I mean, it was numerous. Like the fastest change in the Well, we're, that one too, but I this was this was another one, and it was the color. Um, that you said went from blue to black, which mm -hmm. improved it. But if there's a proliferation of that sort of sign where they're not willing to change the color, that we you will hear about that. Yeah, and it's getting worse. I'm hearing about that one. Scratching on the sign. Well, it's I don't want to say the name, but it's a relatively new business in Vermont. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, but we do if have. If you didn't see it, then. Yeah. Do you watch cars near it? If you didn't see it, you will see it. Yes. <laughs> but further. To be fair, further up um, on 127, one in Viewmont, one further up on, on both on that same east side of the road, there are at least two churches yeah. that have that LED yeah. technology, but it's not as colorful as as the one that we have. And that, that one, I believe Mr. Zelensky had a call a couple times to have them um, stop the, the flashing, strobing message. It has to be static for at least eight seconds. But, but if you reach a point where it's allowed in the ordinance and yeah. folks aren't voluntarily willing to change, then, uh, you know, it could be a problem. That that one was bad, I thought. But if you didn't see it, then you, you missed a show because it was, I'm glad they changed it, or at least for now. And the other one was, the other, further down was not <coughs> electronic, but, Is and I know. Code? Pardon? Is that one within the code? Yes. Okay. I mean, I almost feel bad because there's another business on its side that has no signage yet. I mean, you know, Mr. Wood is correct. I mean, as technology changes and prices come down, we could easily see a proliferation of these. You know, is it something that, that you want to see? There's some communities where a lot of them have it with the overseas technology where it's not as aesthetically pleasing to most to the you know most people so but it is it's extremely difficult to regulate those those lumens or something called nits I don't even know what it means but the, the folks that we have who had these I mean they've been willing to comply with our request to to either regulate the message speed or to turn down the the lumens and they've done it voluntarily there's been one over on 70 near the um, Fairgrove Business Park. We've had that issue with them on and off for years as well. 
should probably make a little gun you can just drive by and click and see what the lumens are. Well, we have a noise meter. And, uh, <laughs> I know they've got temperature, <laughs> temperature guns. I'm not sure. There may be technology that would measure it. It'll come, it'll come if we start getting some, uh, a lot of cities, you know, having to enforce that. I mean, is there a, is, do you have a, an opinion about the LED signs? Is that something you'd like to look at, or are you satisfied with what's allowed currently? Well, with all this gambling and everything, I don't want to be lit up like Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree. With you. Yeah. I mean, we would look for direction from you all if you want us to, to explore flesh that options, out a little bit. Our yeah. options and, and we can always change our code depending on uh, what happens down. Yeah, the, road. the code can be modified any time um, through proper notification, advertising for the planning commission, and and for city council. It doesn't have to be the once a year. You know, there's times when we bring you something between that 12-month period. Certainly, we do that a lot. But we'll, but we'll be in a reactive mode. And I'd rather be yeah. proactive right. on yeah, it. I don't want it all of a sudden it's in our right. face and we have to do something. Then there's yeah. Right now, I don't think these gaming businesses right. can afford such a sign. A lot of them are looking at making a quick buck before the general statutes change. Well, how about we ask to the staff to look at look our at options and, we'll and bring back some options to us of what we can do and tighten yeah. it up. Yeah, okay. sure. Yeah. Because if, if we're concerned about this, uh, the ones that are already there, we would certainly have to grandfather them in. Correct. But we would eliminate future yes, right. problems. All the new development. Right. Well, we're in a good situation right now that we don't have that many of them. So we'll, we'll come back with some options on that particular. Just to let you know, I, there, there are a couple churches that applications are are on the way so okay. so we have typically to, they're not as bright for some reason i don't know why yeah. well, well, i just think it's limit the, the size maybe that will limit well they're usually a bit more subdued i haven't seen many churches that are as flashy as the the new business in in viewmont they're usually uh a, they're pretty conservative <laughs> most let's <laughs> explore our options um, basically, again, uh, I'm not going to read it verbatim, but a lot of these amendments were necessitated due to recent changes in state general statute um, or, or federal law. Um, we're also trying to make sure that the amendments in the Land Development Code are fully consistent and compliant with Hickory by Choice 2030 that you readopted last August. Um, again, the plan itself doesn't specifically address the verbatim language within the LDC, but we just want to make sure that it was uh, that it was copacetic, <coughs> and um, and also that the Land Development Code would continue to protect public health, safety, and general welfare. Um, and just to let you know that the Planning Commission did review this back in March, and they did approve it as is unanimously, but. I don't believe they would have any problems, any changes that, that council wants to make, and we'd certainly consider any revisions. And we'll take a look at the signed ordinance um, specifically. I, I probably, I, you know, I've been out of town, and I probably should have, uh, I wish I could have come sit down with you, because I have uh, several things in here. I well, can we can go, set I can go, up I can go over them now, and it might be uh, good to council here. And let's see. Our subdivisions. We're saying, look, developers, y'all don't have to dedicate streets anymore because that's an unjust taking. Is that what is did I paraphrase it correctly? And it would be Article Two, Section Two Point Three Point Four. Or it, it's highly likely, as according to the language here, that you would consider which, an which section are you talking about, Mr. Two point three point four. Two point three point four. Um, no, that's, that's not what that is saying. That's for a minor subdivision. Basically what that is saying is that uh, we can't re compulsively require someone to dedicate right of way along a proposed thoroughfare. Uh, back uh, prior to my uh, employment with Hickory, there was a practice um, at a point in time where uh, if a thoroughfare existed on a map, Right, yeah, and then, yeah, mm -hmm. the MAP Act. Yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. so that's what this is addressing. Yes, yeah. that, that, not, that, not, our, not the potential no, for no, subdivision no. in a yes. neighborhood no, and streets no, and all no. that. No, what this is saying is this is precluding uh -huh. that from happening. If someone comes in and says, okay, I'm going to build a subdivision. i got 45 acres. I'm going to build 20, 30 lots in here, put in some streets. Yes, all the streets right away will be dedicated on the streets. The streets will be constructed to our specifications, and either they will be privately maintained 
or they will be offered to the city for maintenance. That, that's basically what I was doing. And, and yeah, you hit that on the head. What we were trying to avoid is basically doing an unjust taking of property. And that was a practice that the city did for many years. Mm -hmm. And basically, if it was on a map, whether it was going to be there in the future or not, hey, go ahead and give us up some property. And I never felt comfortable with that just because I didn't think that that was the right thing to do, to be honest with you. And, and as, as Mr. Lale said, uh, the courts as well as the legislature validated that. Uh, formally <laughs> here in the state uh, within the last year or so. The section that, that I do want to bring to your attention is just before that section you were talking about, Councilman Lell. And this is an altogether new section, and I want to, for Council to understand some implications that may go along with this. And this is, um, this is in blue, and it's, it's, it's uh, two, section 2.3.3. .3. This is actually new in the North Carolina General Statutes. It's technically called an expedited review, but it's not really an expedited review. This is an exemption to the subdivision code. Uh, this past fall, I happened to be in Greenville, North Carolina for a planning conference that I ran into uh, a faculty member from the School of Government. And he and I chatted about this for a while, and I said, is this an exemption or what? And he said, well, yeah, kind of, sort of. And you, you, you get that feeling. But what this does, uh, if you can read this expedited review, what this basically does is allows someone to divide a property without putting any infrastructure in whatsoever. So you could take a piece of property that's five, five acres or greater and bust into three lots and not install any streets, any sewer, anything, as long as the lots meet our minimum size requirements. The caveats to that are that it has to meet that requirement and they can't do it but every 10 years. So what that does is precludes this development from coming in and then piecemealing and development together over time. Uh, I think what this kind of does is uh, if anyone's familiar with county zoning, lots of counties have what's called family subdivisions where you can cut a, cut a lot off for Johnny and or Susie and they build a house out back. This kind of does that inadvertently. So just, the implications this may have for the city is, 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 is public services and public safety. We require paved driveway, but that's not an awful lot of anything. Paved driveway could be six, seven feet wide and try to put a fire truck down that to get someone who's having a heart attack. But there's not a lot we can do about it. But that needs to be expressed to council so they at least understand that this is our new normal. We have something we have to deal with here. And if you want to do that in green, where you got to spend the children out 10 years apart. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but, but I mean, that, that, that's, and that's a real concern. The first time I saw it, I was like, ah, oh. but, but yeah, that's uh, I mean, just public safety. That's, that's a true concern I would have on that one. You have to plan for every possibility. I mean, it's just unbelievable. unbelievable. Someone had something that didn't go through for that little off out. I guess that happened. So while I got you, um, the, okay, in our big commercial zones, like CC2, I guess that would be a big, yeah, that's that, that's a corridor zone. Yeah, yeah, corridor zone. You eliminated the requirement for public transit. Yes. Why? I mean, because and here's why. Because if we if we required public transit to be at every commercial development there was, mm -hmm. people my wagons or Greenway is not going to stop at them. Yeah. What we would look at is we would then consult with. Greenway at that point in time to see if there is warranted to have a public transit stop at that location. Okay. Just compulsory saying that every shopping center That's along this stretch here has to put in a traffic, a transit stop is, is, is unrealistic. Right. Um, and, and most of them, for the most part now, are in our shelters that we have adjacent to the right, the right space. Very few buses actually pull into developments. Okay. Into a shopping complex. I, I'll give you this one for example. It, for for those of you that were here when the Lowe's was constructed on in Viewmont. There's a transit stop behind Bank of Granite in that shopping center. And I've never seen a bus go to it. And a bus never has gone in there. And, 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 and that's what we were kind of trying to get away from on that particular <coughs> instance. There. Okay, okay, got another one for you. <laughs> Plan developments, um, got away with, den you did away with prescribed densities mm -hmm. and said any densities will be determined by city council. In compliance with our plan, our overarching. But how are we going to determine de density requirements, gross floor area? You'd, you'd basically then look at what our comprehensive plan says about recommendations for the area. Okay. So that, that does have recommendations, and if you read our comprehensive plan, it does have some recommendations about the types 
and intensities of types of developments that you would have in a place. What that does is it gives council the flexibility of not being tied to X number that's written into a law. Right. And, and that will be what the land development code is, is a law. Right. Where the, land, the Hick by Choice Plan is a recommendation plan. Right. You can either say, okay, yeah, that seems about right, but let's back it down a little but, bit. But on the, on the flip side, if I'm a developer, how do I know what city council is going to approve or not approve? Yeah, that, that, that's, a very, that's a very true comment. There. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. You, 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 then, you, would, you would really look at what the plan has in and of itself. And under what process would they bring it forward to council? And could you run into where your Tom's allowed 65%, Bill's got a little bit better presentation, and we like what he's selling a little bit better, and we give him 80%. And just yeah, it, 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 you could run into that. And, and, and that's what you run into in a legislative process. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Maybe that's one thing y'all can look at. And maybe sure. streamline that as a kick yeah. in the council to determine, you know, max. I think it would be just maximum density, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. No, yeah, right. we're, we're, not setting, we're not setting the bar. The right, bottom low, of it. Low, yeah, low, yeah. So that, yeah, maybe that's something y'all can. Okay. bad around internally sure. because I don't know that I'd feel comfortable trying sure. to yeah and the reason we put that forward is to offer some flexibility I understand I get it Be because yeah. if you have that definitive concrete numbers in a law we can do nothing about it yeah but it's, in, a, in, in it's, it's up there. here right it's up here and everybody knows it. I mean, it's, well, it's whatever it is it's yeah. wherever it is it's there yes, but it exactly. doesn't mean everybody builds to that point is what sure. I'm saying um, to, to your point, it, it, it opens up to play favorites. To play favorites it, and, and puts us in a position maybe that we're not best suited to make a determination. But, and on staff okay. will make a okay. recommendation. Sure. Yes, yeah. sir. But then the developer could come argue with it, it's not enough. Or, yeah. Exactly. So does that come yeah. straight to council or does that go through the planning commission it, first? It would go through both, Mr. Crown. Okay. So if there's a way to tighten and prevent that scenario from playing out to some degree. Sure, sure. We, 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 can, we can review that, yes, sir. Okay, a pitched roofs and, and the multi-family development. Um, why do we do away with pitched roofs adjacent to single family? Because because not everyone constructs a pitched roof on, on our part. I know, but if we're adjacent single family, which most single family homes are pitched roof, why would we not require multi-family to have pitched roofs? That's, that's one that I would... Be against. A lot of times you have parapets, you have taller buildings. I mean, you have different. I, yeah, I understand building sure. construction, but I know in the city you go around and you'll see cases where duplexes were built, flat roofs in a R3 zoning around single family homes and they stick out like sore thumbs. And the requirement that if you're going to do multifamily in an R3, that it be a pitched roof to me is a no brain. We, so we can, we, we can I, review that. I don't also. know how council feels about it. Do y'all do, do y'all understand what I'm yeah. talking about? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so we're eliminating. We know we're going to get less restrictive. Yeah. We're, and we need to be more restrictive for the single family. Oh, we need more sensitive that. to our single family right. homes. I agree. Yeah. And this is an R3, right? Well, I think it's in multifamily development. It would be in R1, R2, and R3 districts. Okay. I mean. I, Part of it may be the structure itself. I don't recall ever seeing many multi-unit pitch roof. I mean, they, are they, we talking like apartment complexes? There's tons of them in Charlotte. I mean, you go down there where there's, there's been redevelopment, you get a lot of multifamily, but they look like houses, and they're in these neighborhoods. And in some cases, they have two fronts on them. They, they might um, be on a corner, and they'll have a, you know, they, the, both, both sides look like front doors. Um, so, what, what are what's our code relating to how many multi-unit housing units we can have in residential? It depends what upon the district, ma'am. Um, it varies. It, it varies. You, you, actually, you can get you can get denser and hicker than anyone will want to build. You you can get 25, 30 units an acre in some of our own districts. No one builds that because there's one. There's not a market here. And, and it's just not going to happen. I mean, our, our, our development ordinance in, in all stretches of imagination is much more generous than anyone would build here. And, and it has been for a number of years, just no one's ever taken advantage of it. And we've offered that, we as an organization and as you as a council offer that as an incentive for development, but no one's ever bit the hook. Just, that's something you can um, maybe look at. Sure. Well, sure. I'm asking that question. That, so, where can you build 
um, apartment units with flat roofs currently versus the independent commercial districts, um, mixed use districts. Okay, so if, so in this case, if if a multifamily unit was going up beside a, re a residential home, mm -hmm. then it would they would have the option of doing either or. I mean, that's that's the change. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's that's where the heartburn is yeah. in terms of y'all would leave it like it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 What, what was the purpose in changing? It? Offer better flexibility in building types. Do you get that a lot from builders? For some, yes, mm -hmm. yes, and, and different because because people try to give, offer you different products to look at in terms of what what, what type of product they want to build with. And in larger cities like Greensboro and Charlotte, you'll see a lot of them where they're the, like the articulated, they look the apartments, the multifamily, they look like boxes. Maybe the color schemes are a little bit. Some of them are pretty out there, but they allow flat roofs and they're like box structures. And some of them are set back off the road, and then they have an overhang to the sidewalk. So it's just a—it's a, it's like Cal said, it's just flexibility for development and for different styles. But if that's something council doesn't want to pursue, you know, we can certainly modify that. Well, maybe in an urban environment, right? When I, um, to the extent we've got urban environments in Hickory, but you know what I mean. In our more commercial environments, that maybe that does make sense. Let's say you were doing something all up against a street front. On 127, maybe you know a flat so, roof there does. So maybe something in the CBD or certain. Yeah, right. That kind of neighborhood. Thing. But, but you start getting into these art districts and the core. allowing flat roofs or giving options for flat roofs is a little bit of heartburn mm -hmm. to me. Now what if you want to build a single family home with a flat roof? I don't think we could prohibit that. No. And we have some of those. Yeah, but there, there, are some, yeah, there are some. It's a yeah. style. It's, a, it's an architectural style yeah, for yeah. single family, but yeah. not for. The, um, well, the I mean, we see a lot more of those. I see a lot more of those here than I did when I was up north for obvious reasons, snow mm -hmm. load. But yeah. there was still those architects that would build a flat roof and so the, it, it would leak or collapse. Wait, so the consensus is leaving that one as is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Okay. Do we need a vote on that? We have to vote to approve the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 I hadn't gone to public here. No. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is just a workshop. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Well, yeah, we'll make the change in change. Code. Yeah, if you change it, we don't have to vote on it. And then you can, we can approve it yeah. just with that. And, these changes. and we take these recommend or these ideas and comments back through the uh, planning commission. Since you said they had already approved of all of these, you don't have to. No, I don't. I'm okay, no, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure okay. you want to. Y'all will find no, okay. I just okay. want them we're, we're taking notes now of any comment that you've gotten. You know, we can bring this back to you with. Yeah, you're not rewriting it. You're pretty much tweaking it. Yeah. Okay. Just let them aware. Of I mean, we just may not be able to go to the first meeting in June with this, but that's. I mean, this is we're not under a, a rush deadline for this. I don't believe. I guess I want them to be aware of our thought process going forward. Just as comments. Okay. I mean, we can convey the the message, but you don't aren't required by law to go back to. Okay. So uh, 8.4.7, which is building lot sizes, you said we're going to amend this so that you don't have a minimum lot size, you have a minimum, it's related to the minimum build, buildable area. So if, I'm, if I understand that correctly, and I, clearly I, some of these I don't understand. <coughs> Four point seven suitable building sites. Yeah, you're looking at A. Um, let's you know what page it is. Uh, I'm looking to find out. I, I got it. I've got it noted on the on the Here, summary sheet. Here's, here's what you're looking 8 at. 4 point, Mr. Leo. It's under section eight point four point seven. This is the subdivision chapter of the land yeah. development code. This does not say that the lot in and of itself have to be 1,250 square foot. What this is saying is there has to be a place on the lot that's buildable that's at least 1,250 1200 square foot. So that's saying that you're basically not creating a non-buildable lot is what it's saying. So your, your minimum lot size which is prescribed by zoning still exists. Right. This is, this is a holdover that's been in our code for probably 30 years. Uh, that, that's a hold back to when you used to have septic tanks and not so much sewer lines everywhere. 
Um, but there is a requirement, and it's been in place for quite a while now, that you have to have a, a building area that is equal to at least 1,200 square feet. So who determines what, what's buildable, what the building area? What? That would be staff. You'd look at topography. You'd look at slope. You'd look yeah. at floodplain yeah. right away. I sewer. wouldn't want to be y'all having yeah. to. Because you can, yeah. you know, that, yeah. I guess it's vague. Is what that's, That yeah. was my point on that one. It, it, and it is. Yes, sir. It's it a is. judgment call. Okay. Um, Article 8, 8.8, .8, the conservation subdivisions. Now, mm -hmm. this one I did not understand either. It's, the summary says the section was amended to increase the amount of conservation area, but if I look at the document, we've gone from 40, from 50 percent with a density bonus, I guess, to 30 percent. Let me flip it here to what we're at here, sir. Stay at this as much as this. You know what page that is? Yeah, it's on page uh, 162. Yeah, yeah you, you basically the conservation area was, has been reduced. Okay, in, in the in the summary it says the conservation area had been increased. That may have been rude. That was an error. Worded, sir. Yeah, yeah, that was an error. So it's been decreased. Yeah, it's been to decreased. thirty percent. Yes, and, and the reason behind that is because these were very. Let's say not Street. popular right, because right. of what you were dealing with in terms of one is that you require to put a developer would be required to put away so much land that then they would have to find someone to perpetually maintain that from right, right. there on out and no one was interested. I think thirty is okay with me. Yeah, sorry about that. that. That was that was a clear clerical error. Yeah, okay, gotcha. Okay, make sure I was reading that one right. And then on the landscaping, I mean, I know you said you talked about Duke uh, Energy, but I mean, you relaxed our parking lot landscaping standards. Mm -hmm. What's driving that? I mean, I'm not. I've not heard any of developers. Well, we have. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> oh yeah. Complaining oh, yeah. about our parking lot yeah. landscaping. Yeah. Um, um, it, it, it's a, it's a common. It's a very common comment that our staff receives every time we review a set of plans. But, okay. I mean, but is it out of whack with what the rest of the landscaping from municipality to municipality across the state is across the board? It, it's from people having a Amazon jungle to a Navajo desert. We're somewhere kind of in the middle, if you will. Yeah. So I mean, that's what you're looking it's at. Mo there. Mostly local developers complaining. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. 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 The, the, the national guys, they'll, they'll do whatever and just go on to the next job. Right. Is it is it too restrictive? Or is it yes. Just, it's, it's too, too much. It, the, the complaint is too much. It's, t it's too much trees in the parking lot. The complaint is then is um, maintenance, uh, trees around automobiles and things like that. Okay, so bellhop mm -hmm. was that developed under the rule you're. No, that, that was developed along a, a previous code. Okay, so give me an example of one that was developed under the existing. Let's see here, we got under this one. Uh, Would that be public? Lowe's? 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 That doesn't yeah. seem overly. Mm -hmm. yep. I don't think it's overly. Yeah, yeah that's all. all. No, there, there, it's not. I mean, it's, it's 30 not. feet on it's center. Not. And we're talking about going to 45, which is a pretty big it's, jump. Yeah. So Publix is within the, the current standard. Correct. And, 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 and you know, I mean, knows I've developed property. Yeah, it's not that I'm insensitive towards cost to develop and stuff like that. But I, I, I'm just looking at ways to relax it so that right. you get better. I, no, you I get, get it. I, look, I think it's important that we're business friendly and that we are sensitive to stuff that makes sense. But I just, I, I mean, I think we're talking about uh, uh, trees that. Um, in the in the end, the the benefit of those that extra tree or two would be, be it's, worth it. It's beneficial. I think the aesthetics of more landscaping, more trees, is better than less. less. Well, it can also be the health of the trees as well, because in here for the street trees, we're at 30 now and we're recommending 50. That is for the health of the tree. And don't forget with the developers, and we do usually hear from the local ones more so than the regional or, or national because they've got a different budget and they just look at the code and like Cal said, some think we're much more restrictive and some think, wow, this is easy peasy, this is great. But a lot of it affects the health of the tree and part of it too is we hear every development project regarding the signs. And I you know, kid around with my staff and saying the trees grow a lot faster than the signs do. I mean, there's some businesses that are just 
turned off their signs or pulled them out because the trees now now cover them. I mean, I understand what you're saying, what we're saying about the landscaping, and we don't think we've cut it too far back, but, you know, whatever council advises. One thing that we've done is we've changed the, the planting types in the parking lot. I mean, you've seen a lot where there was fruit growing trees in the middle of a parking lot, and, uh, and that only leaves a smucker's mess. I mean, some of those acidic berries will eat right through. I had a call yesterday from a local insurance company. Can we please cut down this tree? that's over top of our cars that's eating the paint. And we get calls like that all the time. So, I mean, I understand we gotta maintain that balance with the trees, but we also hear all the time about visibility, not only to signs, but to the business facades themselves. So it is, it's a very delicate balance. But and wouldn't that be changed by them keep raising the canopy as those trees grow? They just maintain them. But it gets back to your issue. Well, some of the trees, I mean, that can't be done. I mean, well, it's it's well, do we it's specify? Yeah. Do we specify the kind of trees yes. that yeah, they can use? We we suggest in our manual of practice, and then when we talk to people, you don't want those fruit-bearing trees. Uh, you don't want trees with thorns. A lot of people in Hickory and up north too used to use white pines as a screen. That happened where the old Hobby Lobby was, where the old Winn Dixie was, um, where they used white pines as a screen from that neighborhood. And after maturity, the white pines will drop everything under 20 feet. So the where's the screen? The screen so the balance disappeared. May be the type of vegetation that is required. Yes, sir. Versus, I mean, I'm yeah, well, and I, I don't know that there is a balance. I think what we got is working good, and I'm, and I'm sorry you guys have to fend that off, but you can put them on council and say, well, hell, that's council pass that damn 30 feet every Oh, believe me, every we, 30 we do. Feet. We good, do. Good, good. <laughs> but I, I don't hear it. I just don't hear it, and uh, I don't think it's unreasonable. When you measure these conservation areas and so forth like that, you say you get so much square footage. If I build a berm, you measure the square footage up one side and then down the other, or do you measure it as far as on? Horizontal. It's, it's horizontal for the base. I mean, Kevin, what is it, every one foot in height? You got to have three or four horizontal versus vertical okay. for a berm. One to three. One to three. But I mean, I can build a steep berm in there and get that square foot. So it's I'm hearing that thing right on the street. This council's comfortable with the current rule, but but I'm hearing you have had issues with types of vegetation, and types species. of vegetation and species too close together. Well, so, uh, I mean, I can see that side of it. I mean, you don't want an apple tree growing in the middle of a, you know. Yeah, I don't. You know, I don't see why we, we, can't we yeah. suggest or or state no apple trees. No well, apple trees. so make, can, we, can we make that change? We'll keep the current standards generally that come it back with the type of vegetation. But yeah. we can we'll change the specific. Yeah. And, and just to, so we're the message we're pre preaching is be business friendly business. So I appreciate that. I mean, so they're pushing uh, yeah. the yeah. envelope in some areas where we where it makes sense to change. So don't get the message that you're going. So this is good. This is a good find out where the limits are. Well, this will probably, um, Mr. Wood, necessitate the manual of practice being revised, but we can work with Kevin and and his folks to do that and we're still continuing to work with with Duke okay we got one one last thing and that is uh, and this is not uh, self serve of course we uh, we have a furniture mall out there and I happen to notice the change in parking requirements we got plenty of parking by the way we can meet the current <laughs> sure. proposed changes so it's not about us is what I'm saying but I do did want to explain that um, from a furniture current um, currently Furniture stores have a different requirement for parking than typical retail. And I presume the reason is because if you're selling furniture, you're, it takes a lot of floor space to show sofas, bedrooms, nightstands. Right. So it's, it's a much different uh, traffic pattern than you would have at a clothing store, right? So putting furniture stores in with regular retail I don't think that's not working. I don't think that one's the good. And then the health club gym, I didn't really know on that one. That was the other one that you're recommending getting away, going away with. Yeah. So well, some of them we have our different one that we've dealt with over the years. And when I first came here, and Cal was already here, you know, we had a not only was our use table 22 pages, but our parking was much, much broader as well. Where 
you know, would say this type of store needs this much parking. One thing that we come up repeatedly is for a sit down, for a restaurant, we require eight spaces. For a sit down restaurant, yeah. For McDonald's, no. So these are things we're always going back and forth with. I mean, if you have any recommendations, I would recommend you. You're the, the, you're the expert. The same unless, yeah, unless there's been, uh, unless y'all had some specific experience that would. No, and uh, as far as the parking problem. Basically, what we because did. they're becoming more intense. What you're taking them to a more intense. You're yeah, making, basically you're making what we did, it what we did, we were build more parking. We were collapsing, uh, just like Brian said, we were collapsing things into to basically single categories. Yeah, right. And the numbers we were coming, well, we weren't pulling them out of the air. Uh, those numbers are coming for an institute traffic transportation engineers. They have a parking generation manual, and those numbers. Are, I was pulling the numbers from the parking studies that were done. So those aren't something we're making up or getting from some other city or whatever. But, but There's actually case studies that show these numbers exist. But you said well, the way this is written is, or what you said in your summary was that furniture stores are being eliminated Yeah, because, because, it's, because it's, they're covered under some other broad use. Under retail. Correct. Retail. Well, that, I mean, if well, you're, I, 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 I hear you, but they are retail. I understand. I understand. <laughs> yeah. I, and I'm not trying to be argumentative. Like I, 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 I understand. But you, I think you understand the point. It takes a lot of space to show furniture, and um, so time and square footage is more difficult. Uh, and, and on that, yeah, I get that. Can, can we? Go, can I go back to one thing with with council and Brian and I talked about this. We never really uh, pulled it out here. Landscaping and car lots. You want to talk about something when it screams is a car lot that sells. Cars. Tens of thousands of dollars of cars and have trees planted on them in the parking lot, stuff to follow them. Yeah. But we had considered trying to do something with the ordinance to do vehicle sales lots. Um, would that be something that counts would be? If we we're going to have to revisit some of this now, would that be something that. They would be exempt. Well, not exempt altogether, but reduce, reduce yeah. it. Because yeah, I what, what you're having. Yeah, got, I understand. I have to be supportive of that. You, you have a say, take Honda oh, Cartier, they have $5 million dollars outside. of cars out here. Yeah. 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 yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. Uh, it's, that, that's something that I hear yeah. all the time. Yeah, that one. I agree. I could understand. Uh, I, just, I just wanted to float that okay. before I sit down. and. Okay. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> well, back to, I mean, I, while you're tweaking, I don't know if there was any resolution to the furniture. <laughs> sure. If we want to leave it the same, it, it's not been a problem. We're okay. basically trying to consolidate uses is what we're trying yeah, to do. Yeah, okay. So, I, I mean, there, there's no heartburn on our end. I mean, yeah. it, 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 and, and health clubs and gyms, too. I don't know there if that needs to, that was, I don't know what broad category that would be under. Uh, it, it, there's actually a um, category in the uh, Institute of Transportation Engineers does. and. Uh, it was health clubs, fitness clubs, spas, and a whole bunch of other things, and the numbers were all across the board. There, right. there was, yeah. if you look at the standard deviation in the study, it, it, none, none of the studies even related to one another. I'm not quite sure how it all worked out there. Lots of outliers. Yes, exactly. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. So, and, and I appreciate y'all. We, we have been you know, preaching business friendly and where we can make things simple, and that's, that's what you're getting here. So this exchange is really good, finding out where the limits are, because ultimately it is city council's policy, oh, it's not our policy. Council members, I don't get many complaints on businesses and things, and especially Ward 3, we got a lot of them. Yeah. Maybe they just come to the city with it. Yeah. I get a lot of complaints about the feather signs. About what? Feather. To allow them or allow them? Feather signs. Feather. To, to allow them. Well, it, it's a much less expensive alternative for certain for certain businesses that can't afford a wall sign or or a monument sign. I mean, we've had issues with uh, recently churches doing it that aren't fully established yet. But if we could, we're trying to, we're trying to get that that balance. We do allow those people that have come in to us, maybe have received a letter. Or a phone call from, you know, myself, Cal, Ross, Tyler, saying, "I'm sorry, ma'am, sir, you got to take that feather flag down, or you got 10 days to take it down." We offer them the alternative because we do offer temporary banners um, as as well. But it's just something in the past that it, it just has. It's not something I think conducive to the environment that we want to that we want to have. Well, I've noticed like the churches that meet in other staff, like the schools. Jenkins has a church, and then on Sunday they put out the signs. That well, we offer the alternative of a temporary banner. 
relatively inexpensive. Some people avail themselves of that and some do not. I was going to say, is there any way we could tweak that um, as far as maybe operation, operation hours, they can have them out and then put them back up once they close? Yeah, that's that's the problem. It's I mean, I respect the idea, but it's not really enforceable and most of the businesses um, will leave them up continuously. Not saying not all. Yeah, Some people are very diligent and, and respectful to the law, but others will just leave them up all the time. And, you know, we have one person for for 29 square miles it's, it's extremely difficult to enforce i mean i have recently had churches basically ratting each other out on site <laughs> no i mean yeah. i love the lord and all but what i'm saying is like as far as a small business you know sometimes those feather signs mean a lot you know especially if they're, if they're just opening and they're trying to get customers to notice them and they can't afford a lot of the signage that we spoke about Those well again really we important. do have both a temporary 12-week banner and a banner that is renewed annually that they could have now if council or the manager's office tells me we'd rather see that pennant flag than a maximum 32 square foot temporary banner we can certainly modify the ordinance it's it's fully up to up to council in the past council has told us they didn't like the feather flags but if that's I think so, the feather flags are serve a purpose, and they're not any more uh, distracted than, than what we allow now. But I was, if we were going to do feather flags, I'd want to put a limit on them. Time. Time. Put a limit on how many you can have. And, uh, but we've already well, got the banners. Yeah, and, and, and forcibility, because we keep a record of those signs, those temporary banners that we permit. We have a record of those. And when someone gets to the end of their year, we will notify them. You either need to take it down or renew it. And the same for the 12 week. And if it's a feather flag, I'm not sure we want to get into permitting a feather flag. And before you know it, those will, will proliferate. Those will be everywhere. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's something that's totally up to well, we, to we can look at some options on what other communities have done. I mean, maybe a grand opening. Sort well, of what thing. I would suggest to that with all due respect, is drive up north of MDI on a Saturday and count the feather flags. Oh, it'll, they, they could end up being like the bandit signs, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. that you see. Because there might be open in Pandora's box. But we could look at some options on what might be possible. So. I'd, I'd be, I would be supportive of looking maybe at some options. Banners, um, and, and I know you prescribed the actual, how big the banner can be. But they, uh, from a business perspective, um, they've probably gotten more expensive than feather flags. I don't, I've never bought a feather flag. But the banners are difficult to attach and then to attach firmly and you get them to look good and you get a wind that comes through and they rip up and, it, I mean, so. Feather flags you see. Yeah. yeah they're right. tall and. It, yeah, yeah, so I, I don't know. Um, I, I tend to, yeah, I, you I, it might be a use. One councilman. Just hates that's a council woman. Oh. They, 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 do you hear more like for, 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 for new openings for businesses or, or just new, new openings and just people that are trying to get people to you know customers to notice their business? Um, you know, as they're, as they're driving by, you know, it, it's just like when the car, car does just put a giant monkey out there just to make you look, right? You know, and sometimes you have some businesses that are really struggling financially and they're trying to do anything possible to gain attention right. from ongoing customers and you know and, and if we're in the we're trying to be business friendly i just think that maybe we could regulate it maybe it could be smaller or something i just thought i would just mention that because okay. that is a complaint that we'll i get look at that oh, or just or just for the record we don't allow inflatable monkeys either <laughs> We've gotten in trouble with those two. We had a lawsuit with yeah, was it yeah. Lenore? That we with inflatable Santas. Yes. We uh, mm -hmm. prevailed in that litigation. But if the, if the mind of councils changed, just you know, with the feather flags, let it just feather flags. They spoil what we can. However, do. we'll be directed. We'll, we'll take care of it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Even though you don't. Well, like any more questions? Good work. Council? Thank you. I'll consider any. Mr. Mr. Fraser. <laughs> Okay, sir. All right, uh, uh, item three. All right, lastly, um, the budget. So things are going to start moving more quickly with our bond uh, projects. And the first one moving very quickly is um, Trivium Corporate Center. And 
beer. We've got a uh, groundbreaking out there tomorrow at three o'clock, and we're hoping that there's a break in the rain um, during the, during the groundbreaking. But um, my guess is we're moving. We are moving forward with that. Okay, yeah. So that is on. Um, but in addition to that, related to that. Uh, property in behind there we are recommending moving forward with purchasing um, uh, two parcels uh, from two separate property owners and it requires a budget amendment of um, 2.345 million and I think that's a little bit more than the initial amount that went out um, which was an estimate this is actually the amount on the closing statement so um, and half of that is City of Hickory and half of that is Catawba County and this will come out of the City of Hickory's bond proceeds um, and uh, on our side. So we are recommending uh, approval of first reading on this budget amendment. Then we would, if approved, we would come back at your meeting at seven o'clock and do the second reading and, and move forward with the closing. So it's running through our budget because we're the financial um, right. jurors do yeah. And that, that's right. a good, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so it's not yeah. Trivium, Trivium Corporate Center Board will actually be the property owner, but we, right. the money's flowing through us uh, to them. So but the county starts. will be paying us. Correct. <laughs> yeah. 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 Rodney's already got his invoice teed up. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> and as far as the reimbursement from the bonds, since all? we're not going to be issuing bonds probably till the following mm -hmm. year, it will be... We, Fund balance, fund, yeah. and okay. that's a, fund that's balance another good point. So yeah, here's the fund balance. So gonna we're gonna we're front ending a lot of bond mm -hmm. expenses, and that will be reflected in our upcoming audit for mm -hmm. this fiscal year. We will replenish that in August, but the the audit will reflect the numbers as of June 30th. So your fund balance is going to show a hit uh, with all these expenditures. Uh, that's why it's important that the county pay us before the end of the fiscal year. <laughs> uh, but we'll have those footnotes when we go. Yes, it, it, yeah. so we'll, we'll, okay. we'll show you really what the bottom line is, but the, the auditor's bottom line is going to be a lot less than where we're actually going to end up. So okay. um, but that's a good point. Thank you. So you need a uh, motion? Yes. Um, make a motion to approve the property acquisition for Trivium Corporate, Corporate Center. I'll second, second that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. That's it. All right. Motion, motion to adjourn. So moved. So I have, have a motion, have a second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Adjourn. All right, so there's food. First four conference room where we meet for closed session.